Please join me in welcoming back to the stage, Maryam Tuzani. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, for, for bringing the film to the festival. Um, I want to begin with a question about the inspiration of where this story came from. Um, it's, it's quite powerful if you could share it with us. <laughs> this um, story is a very personal one because um, it, it was inspired by a, by a woman that I met that my parents um, uh, sheltered uh, when I had moved back from university. One day there was a woman that came knocking on our door. Um, she was eight months pregnant and uh, she was totally desperate. She had nowhere to go. Nobody knew from her village that she was pregnant. She had left because um, it's very hard for, for a woman to be um, pregnant out of wedlock in Morocco. And so she came knocking on our door and my mom um, just couldn't let her go in that state because she was very, very worried for her. She was, uh, she was in a very tired, you know how it is when you're eight months pregnant, it's not easy. And so she decided to bring her in for a few days and um, try to help her find a solution. But very quickly, my parents realized that there was no solution because um, nobody knew that she was pregnant. She had nowhere to go. And at, the, at that period in Morocco, it was illegal to give birth in a hospital if you were not married. So if you gave birth, they would call the police and they would take you to prison, basically. So a lot of women ended up giving birth on the street. And my parents decided to leave her with us. So she stayed with us until the moment she gave birth. And she wanted to give birth and give her child up for adoption in order to be able to go back home uh, to her village, to her parents, and start anew. And in order to be able to give her child a future. Because also at that time, when the child was born out of wedlock, he didn't even have a name. He didn't exist socially. Thank you. So, so, so basically... I kept, um, I mean, I, I experienced all of this with her from the moment she moved into our house to the moment she gave birth. And I actually went with her to give her child up for adoption. And that deeply, deeply moved me. It, it really marked me. And many years after, I think it was 14 years after when I got pregnant with my first child, who, which is two years old now, I started thinking of her all the time. It was something, I mean, I couldn't help but thinking of what she had gone through. Because I, I saw how she tried to, to keep herself from loving this child, uh, how she tried to um, stifle her emotions, but there was something about this maternal instinct that was t too strong, that was overwhelming. And becoming a mother myself, I really, I really felt her, I really understood her, and I just felt the need, the urgency to, to write this story, to talk about her. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you, yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the, the political climate now and, and what you hope this film might do in Morocco as well in terms of the legality of, of children born out of wedlock. I'm hoping that it can create a, a real debate, a constructive debate, because a lot of times in, in Morocco, I have the feeling that there is uh, debates that are very um, that stay on the surface, but that themes like this that are so important are not really treated, and the the, the laws uh, don't really change. And um, it's true that since 2004, a child born out of wedlock can have a name, but that same child uh, will. I mean, you can tell through his ID card that he is born out of wedlock, and the and the the social pressure is so enormous. It's so hard for such a child to exist in a society like Morocco because he's completely put aside. Like like she says, it's 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 almost like being worthless. That uh, that I mean, at the end of the day, I think that even if laws don't necessarily change. For me, what has to change is, uh, is society's, uh, society's view. And I think that if you can change a society's vision on, a, on, on something, the laws will necessarily follow. So I'm hoping that, that, uh, that this film will be able to trigger, to trigger change, to trigger a debate, and to, and to make things advance. And And on a on a film level, the performances are so affecting. Can and it's incredibly your first time directing a feature film, which you know, seeing this seems improbable. It's so beautiful, <laughs> really. Can you talk about working with them, the casting process, because it is so intimate? They barely leave the frame. 
Yeah, it is. It is very intimate. I wanted this film to be very intimate. That's also why I chose to to have this kind of a reclos where everything takes place on the inside. The only contact with the outside is this window where you where you see life, where you perceive some things. I didn't want to say too many things about about the society. I didn't want things to be said. I wanted things to be felt. And uh, for me, um, it was extremely important to to be able to. Um, to penetrate the souls of these two women uh, through the image, to have a camera that is um, at the right distance. Sometimes um, it's it's not easy because you want to be, uh, I don't know how to, how to explain this, um, to, to be at the right distance is, is complicated because um, it's all about showing things, but not showing them too much as well. It's, I wanted to, to, to be in their, I don't know, in, in, in their skin, uh, you know, that we could feel who they were from the inside, not only as a voyeur, I didn't want it to be voyeur at all. Um, that's why there is a lot as well of uh, uh, gros plan. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you say that in English. Uh, close, close up. Close ups, close there is a lot of close ups as well, because I really wanted us to feel as viewers uh, what it really meant to be under their skin such as to feel their, their inner struggles as well, to be really with them. Um, I would like to open it up to the audience if there are any questions. Uh, please raise your hand nice and high, and I will also repeat the question for the benefit of people who might not have heard. So, uh, right here in the front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, it's it, and I think it's a testament to you to you know your writing and the writing process as well um, that it is so honest and affecting. And I know you said you were writing while you were pregnant as well. Can can you talk a bit about the process of penning the script? Yeah, no, definitely. I I mean I didn't know that I was going to write this film. I I didn't know. I mean honestly, I just. It wasn't something that I had thought about, but like I said before, when I got pregnant, I started really thinking about this woman, about what she had felt, about what she had gone through. And so I started, when I started, really, it all started when I started feeling my child inside me and feeling it moving. And I realized how hard it must be for, for a woman to know that she has to give that child up, not because she wants to, but because she has to, she has no other choice to try to keep herself from loving something that you love instinctively because you, you can't, I mean, you can't help it. It's something stronger than you. So that's how I started writing. I mean, I just, I didn't know what this film was, that it was gonna become a film. I just needed to let it out. And then also my, my experience of life because it's had been 14 years since and I had experienced loss and I had experienced grief. And so this other character of Abla just materialized itself as well. And I didn't really know why it was Abla and why she, she was leading the struggle that she was leading, which is not being able to face her own grief, to, to really mourn her husband, to move on. I don't know, I think there's some things that, that happen for a reason. And I think the beauty in life as well is just to let yourself get carried along and not think too much sometimes. And this film was a bit like that. It was just uh, letting myself uh, feel things that had to, you know, be, that I felt and that transform themselves into this, this script. And that, like I said, was something that just came out very naturally because it had to. Yes, here on the aisle. So the question is in regards to the adoption process um, for, for children who are born out of wedlock and the legalities of it, essentially. Well, now it has changed. I mean, now a child born out of wedlock can have a name. Like I was saying before, it's changed since 2004. He has a legal status. Before, he did not have a legal. A child born out of adoption of, uh, of wedlock did not have a legal status. That's, um, that is a huge change. But it still doesn't give these, these ch children the same rights as a child born out of wedlock. They're completely unequal in, 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 um, in a lot of aspects. So who, so then who adopts? They are adoptable. They are adoptable. But if they're not adopted and they stay with their mother, they have no rights, basically. But if you give them away or you abandon them, 
well then they will go into an orphanage and they'll end up getting adopted. That's one of the reasons why she decides to give her child up because she wants him to have a future because she knows that with her, he has absolutely no future. That's why as well she has no choice. So the question is in regards to more of the specificity of the legalities of the adoption. So does the status change, for instance, on their birth certificate if they if they are adopted? The status, I mean, the, the they will know that it's a child. If a child is abandoned, for instance, nobody knows if it's out of wedlock or not. You know, it's just going to be taken into an orphanage and it's going to be it's going to be adopted. It's not going to be on, on on their legal documents that that he's out of wedlock because they don't know where he's coming from, basically. But uh, this. Anyways, adoption laws are quite complicated in Morocco. And uh, a child, also a child that's, that is adopted doesn't have the same legal rights as a child that's not adopted. So that's a, that's a complete, that's a, an even very complex issue as well on its own. Mm, thank you. Yes, right here in the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is in regards to the scene with the, the, the tape and dancing and sort of forcing Abla to come to life again in a way. And also if you can speak to the trio of the you know two grown-ups and then of course yeah. their incredible young lead. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start with the with the little girl and why it was important for me to have uh, to have to have this little girl. Um, I think that a lot of things uh, that we forget as adults uh, about 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 life, basic things uh, that we forget as adults, because society sometimes make us makes us think in a certain way. I think that children are free from all that those things, and it's true that my first uh, my first short films. Uh, there was always in my first fil short films. There was always the main character was always a child, and um, and I saw the world through the eyes of a child. And it's true that I am a little bit of a child inside as well. And I think that there's a lot of things that we can learn from children because they bring us back to to um, to things that are essential. Uh, because they don't have all these obligations. They don't know what social pressure is generally. They're free. They're more free than we are. And I think their innocence is also their strength. That's why I also wanted to have this, uh, this little girl in this house. Um, regarding the tape, yes, that's a scene that was extremely important for me. Um, I remember when I was uh, when I was writing the script, I used to listen to that song nonstop, nonstop. Uh, it's a song about... Um, about uh, about loss as well. It's a song about uh, longing, and uh, I felt that there was something so true about what this song told, the the, the lyrics of the song and what Abla felt. Uh, and for me, Abla's character is is a, is a character that is frozen in time. She's a woman that has not been able to 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 let herself free uh, from her past, and. Because of that, she cannot give love to her daughter, which is the only thing she has left in the world. And she has closed herself to all emotion, and she has become dry and bitter, and uh, and lost uh, her femin femininity as well. And so this moment for me was crucial because it was putting her face to face with something that was extremely important for her. And I think sometimes you need to be brutalized, and you need to be pushed, and you, it, need, it, can, it can only happen in a violent manner, I mean, in a violent manner such as this one, because she's put face to face with something that she's been trying to flee all the time. And for me, it was important that this came through Samia, because Samia understood very quickly what was happening in this woman's life and what was keeping her from moving on. Yes, uh, right here in the front. So the question is in regards to, to cooking, especially the bread and the scene with the, the kneading of the dough and why that was important and the meaning behind that too. 
Yeah, thank you for that question. I think the kneading of the dough uh, accompanies very well the the character Abla's Abla's uh, evolution throughout the film, and uh, for me it was very important to show how how her all these little little details, little gestures that sometimes can seem insignificant can have a huge importance because when she, this woman needs her dough at the beginning, she's not really present. She's not really there. She just does it mechanically, and it goes the same for the rest of the way she leads her life. She's uh, she's cut herself off from other, that emotion. So feeling that dough that she's needing helps her um, f feel things that she stopped feeling many years back. So I think for me, for me it was essential. And that's why as well I wanted to film that with close-ups. I wanted once again to have this uh, visual feeling of the dough. I wanted the viewers to be able to, to also feel that, that it not only be something that you look at from the outside, but be in the sensation itself. Thank you. Yes, here in the back. Yeah. Yep. So it's um, the two questions. One, if there was any inspiration drawing from Le Petit Prince by chance, um, because you were saying there's a ch the use of children in your films. And also, um, whether it will be allowed to be screened in Morocco um, in order to incite the kind of change and debate that you were speaking about earlier. Um, I don't know if I was directly inspired by Le Petit Prince. I, I wasn't directly inspired, but it's true that I've read Le Petit Prince so many times. And uh, I mean, there's things that you don't think of consciously. So maybe there is somewhat an inspiration from Le Petit Prince because I think it's su such a beautiful book. And I think it teaches us so, so many things about life and about you know the, the wisdom of, a, of, a, of children and of childhood. And things is like I was saying before that I think like adults, we can learn again. So, uh, so yeah, I guess unconsciously there must be something there. <laughs> and um, if the film will be screened in Morocco, yes, the film will, will, uh, will come out in Morocco uh, in January. And I can't wait for that. I'm really, really eager. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that, w that it will create a debate. And, and I believe it will. I believe it will. Thank you so much for sharing the film. Unfortunately, I'm getting the sign that we do have to wrap up here. We do have another screening coming in, but please, another big round of applause for Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kiva. Thank you. <laughs>